Welcome to the last lecture of Bio 110. We are going to be covering two or three different topics that are going to be the last of the series in signal transduction. What I would like to show you with this image is an overview of the major signal transduction pathways that we have covered in class. We have talked about G protein coupled receptors, which are receptors that could be activated by chemokines, hormones, or other uh, neurotransmitters. But we also have learned about receptor tyrosine kinase. Today, we are going to be looking at cytokine receptors, as well as some of the signals that are activated through all three of these receptors. What I also want you to have, it's the vocabulary to be able to understand a graph of this nature. So you'll be able to then look at one of these pathways and see the and identify the major players that are going to be involved in signaling. And therefore, irrespective of what the receptor is, the signal transduction pathways that are activated are going to be conserved with many different types of cells. So be a lymphocyte or a neuron, the receptors may be different, but the signal transduction pathway that is activated are going to be similar. And before we go, I would like to include a slide again about the G protein couple receptors and how they are able to activate different motifs that will have different effects. So in this case, what we have is a G protein couple receptor that is associated with a trimeric G protein. This trimeric G protein, it's inactive because it's bound to GDP. So the G alpha unit, it's bound to GDP and therefore is inactive. But Upon activation, you're going to have an exchange of that GDP for GTP. And depending on the type of receptor tyrosine, excuse me, depending on the type of G protein that you have, you can have a G protein that is inhibitory, that will be a molecule that will inhibit adenyl cyclase and therefore inhibit the production of cyclic AMP, but it may be able to open up ion channels or activate phospholipases. A G alpha S subunit, once activated by GTP, is able to activate and turn on adenyl cyclase, and that will result in an increase in cyclic AMP. The G alpha Q is able to activate phospholipases to increase the amount of diethylglycerol and IP3 and therefore lead to the activation of protein kinase C. Last but not least, you also have the G-alpha-12-13, which are able to activate the rho monomeric G proteins and therefore turn on the MAP kinase pathway uh, that will be effect eventually lead to the activation of the junk kinase. But remember that also you have the activation of the gamma beta subunit. And the activated gamma beta subunit is able to turn on and open ion channels like the potassium channel. And we'll see that it's going to be able also to activate the PI3 kinase or adenyl cyclases or receptor kinases. So you will have different motifs that will be able to be um, turn on once the ligand binds to the G protein couple receptor. So let's begin by having an introduction about the PI3 kinase system. And that is going to be one of the new signaling pathways that we're going to cover in class. As we have discussed before, certain phospholipids are the target of enzymes that are going to modify them. So in this case, in the middle here, we have PIP2, which is an inositol, phosphoinositol 4,5-biphosphate, and this is a phospholipid that is present in the cytosolic part of the membrane. We have learned that PIP2, it is the substrate that gets activated and cleaved by phospholipase C. And the two products of phospholipase C hydrolysis are going to be diacylglycerol and inositol 1,4,5-triphosphate, or IP3. So when phospholipase C cleaves PIP2, you will have the product of diacylglycerol and IP3. IP3, being a soluble molecule, will be able then to diffuse in the cytoplasm until it reaches the ER. 
When it reaches TAR, it can bind to the IP3 receptor, and opening the receptor allows for the release of intracellular calcium from the ER together. Now, protein kinase C can be recruited by diacylglycerol and by the release calcium uh, from IP3 binding to the receptor in the ER together. Uh, now, both these signals activate protein kinase C. But another new molecule that we have, uh, that we're going to learn today, also uses PIP2 as a substrate, and that is the PI3 kinase. The PI3 kinase is able to take one phosphate from ATP and give it at position three of PIP2, generating a PIP3, which contains a phosphate in position three, four, and five. Now, that molecule, uh, it's a phospholipid that it's bound in the cytoplasmic portion of the membrane, and it serves as a docking site for enzymes that are going to be recruited from the cytoplasm. The phosphatase P10 works on the opposite direction. It can take PIP3 and remove the phosphate added from position 3 to go back and result in the generation of PI2. Later, that PIP2, excuse me, it could be phosphorylated again by PI3 kinase, or it could serve as a substrate for phospholipase C to generate more diacylglycerol and IP3. So when PIP3 kinase phosphorylates PIP2 to create PIP3, what he has generated is a docking site to recruit molecules that are present in the cytoplasm. So for example, here we have a receptor tyrosine kinase that open binding to the ligand will then recruit the adapter molecule PI3 kinase. Once PI3 kinase binds to the phosphotyrosines in this activated receptor tyrosine kinase, it will be activated. And upon activation, it will take PI 45P2, I'm putting here the numbers where the phosphates are present in the inositol, and phosphorylated to generate PI345P3. This phospholipid, now present in the cytosolic side of the membrane, becomes the docking site for two different proteins. These proteins have the capacity to bind to the phospholipid because they contain what is called the plex string homology or pH domain, and the pH domain binds to PIP3. One of them is going to be AKT, and that's going to be the important kinase that we're going to be discussing today. So P AK3, excuse me, AKT will be recruited by binding to the PIP3 on the membrane, and another protein that will be recruited to the membrane as well will be PDK1, or PI-dependent kinase 1. One PDK1 binds to uh, the PIP3 through its pH domain, it gets activated and is able to phosphorylate AKT in a threonine residue. Now, you have another soluble kinase called mTORC2, and mTORC2 will now phosphorylate AKT in a different location. This doubly phosphorylated AKT now can detach from the cytosol uh, side of the membrane and is able now to diffuse and phosphorylate targets downstream that are going to be required for signal and survival. One of those targets is going to be the protein BAD. BAD, it's a pro-apoptotic member of the BCL2 family. BAD in the side of soul, it's able to bind the anti-apoptotic BCL2. And when BAD binds to BCL2, it will lead to the cell death by apoptosis. Now, when activated AKT, it detaches from the membrane and comes down to the cytosol, it can phosphorylate BAD. Phosphorylation of BAD inactivates the protein, allowing it to release BCL2, which now can become active. Active BCL2 can now travel to the mitochondria, where it will promote cell survival. So, Having BAD be active is bad for the cell, and the cell will die by apoptosis. We're allowing BCL2 to be free 
will prevent apoptosis. And this is one of the pathways that we're going to be learning more in class to understand the mechanisms by which cells modulate cell death. So we're going to be looking more into this pathway in chapter 18. So make sure to review this pathway well. What we're going to look now are two fast tracking signaling pathways. The fast tracking signaling pathways are distinguished from the tr traditional pathways that we have learned so far in that they do not require amplification cascades in the signaling pathway. So for example, remember that we have discussed that an amplification cascade involves adenylcyclase um, hydrolyzing ATP to generate cyclic AMP or the mediation of phospholipase C that is going to cleave PIP2 into diacylglycerol and IP3. Those are amplification steps in a signal transduction pathway. But the fast tracking signal pathways do not require that level of amplification because oftentimes what's going to happen is that they will directly generate a transcription factor that is able to uh, travel to the nucleus and activate uh, transcription of a desired gene without the need of amplification. So we're going to learn about two of these pathways, the jak stat pathway in cytokine receptors and the notch delta pathway that mediates cell-to-cell -cell interactions. So let's talk about the cytokine receptors. Cytokine receptors are receptors um, that bind small protein ligands called cytokines, and you can think of cytokines as the hormones of the immune system. The receptors are usually dimeric, as shown over here in this cartoon. And what they have evolved, uh, they are very similar to receptor tyrosine kinase, except that the kinase domain is now mediated by an independent protein called JAK for Janus kinase. So the Janus kinase, um, it's a independent kinase domain that associates non-covalently to the cytokine receptors. Just like the receptor tyrosine kinase, you need to have two different members of the cytokine receptor to associate. So when a cytokine is present, shown here in red, the JAKs are able to now exert a phosphorylation event across to the other JAK. So therefore, the jack of the right phosphorylate the jack on the left, and the jack of the left phosphorylate the jack kinase on the right. This activates the jacks to allow them now to phosphorylate tyrosines in the receptor molecules themselves. So in this regard, that is no, that is not very different from the activation of receptor tyrosine kinases. But what is interesting here, it's the recruitment of these adapter proteins called STATs. STATs stands for signaling transducer and activation of transcription. And a STAT contains an SH2 domain that is going to allow it to bind to the phosphotyrosine that has been generated in the receptor tail. Now, when they have been brought in close proximity to the JAK, the JAK kinase is able to phosphorylate a tyrosine in the STAT regulatory protein. So the left JAK phosphorylates the left STAT and the right JAK phosphorylates the right STAT. Once they are phosphorylated, the STATs disassociate from the receptor and they bind to one another through the SH2 domains that they have, sort of like a yin and yang um, motif or a Pisces motif. So this SH2 domain of one stat binds to the phosphotyrosine of the other one and vice versa. This generates an active stat that is able to migrate to the nucleus and bind to the regulatory regions of a gene, allowing for initiation of transcription. Here in the left, what we have is a small animation movie that I would like you to see that shows how the JAKSTAT signaling pathway mechanism works. So take a moment to look at that uh, video. One thing that I would like to point out is that different receptors can bind different JAKs. So some receptors can bind, for example, a JAK1 in the left receptor, but it could bind a JAK2 on the right part of the receptor. So that then is going to determine the 
kind of stat that is going to bind. And different stats can bind to one another. This doesn't have to be a homodimer. It could also be a heterodimer. For example, a, a stat 4 can bind to a stat 6 to form a transcription factor. So depending on the kind of stats that bind to one another, that will lead to different binding in regulatory regions of different genes. And that allows for the utilization of few checks to activate a different level of stats because of the combinatory diversity. The next fast track signaling pathway that I want to bring up to you is the notch signaling pathway. As we discussed before, the notch signaling pathway mediates cell to cell signaling. And in the case of cell to cell signaling, what you're going to have is one cell, shown here at the bottom, that has the notch receptor. Another cell, shown here on the top, has a notch ligand. In this case, it's going to be the delta molecule. Once the cells interact with one another in a cell-to-cell -cell interaction, the intracellular domain of the notch protein gets disassociated by a proteolytic cleavage and is able to become a transcription factor that tra travels to the nucleus where it will now activate gene expression. So in this case, again, there is no amplification of signal because the interaction of the ligand with the receptor mediates the cleavage of a transcription factor that directly goes to the nucleus and alters gene expression. So let's take a look in more detail about the notch signaling. So what we have here, in mammals, there are multiple different notch receptors that can bind to multiple different ligands. The one that I'm going to concentrate here as a ligand is going to be the ligand delta. But there's another ligand that binds to notch called jagged, um, here, shown here in the left. What we have here in the center of the image is a notch receptor. The notch receptor has two domains, one outside of the cell and an intracellular domain. Now, when a ligand binds to notch, that, in this case delta, that interaction is going to promote a conformational change. And that conformational change is going to expose a proteolytic site for a protease called TACE. TACE stands for TNF-alpha-converting enzyme, or another name for it is ADAN17. Therefore, once delta is engaged to notch, that opens off that proteolytic site in the outside of the receptor that will cleave the receptor off. Cleaving the receptor off will now expose a second internal proteolytic site, and that internal proteolytic site becomes cleaved by the gamma secretase enzyme. Once gamma secretase cuts down the intracellular notch domain shown here with the yellow portions, that notch intracellular is able to travel into the nucleus where it will then activate signaling, activate transcription, excuse me. For example, certain genes that are going to be activated by notch are bound by a transcription factor called CSL. But CSL oftentimes is found by a co-repressor shown here as CoR. When the co-repressor binds to CSL, transcription is inhibited in those cells. But when the notch IC, the NIC molecule now inside the nucleus, binds to CSL, is able to displace away the co-receptor and recruit a co-activating molecule. Now, when the coactivating molecule is recruited together with the notch IC, you can then activate CSL to transcribe the particular gene and therefore initiate a signal transcription pathway that will produce that protein. And here again, I'm putting the entire image so you can have it uh, from the beginning. So this is considered fast tracking because you will generate upon binding to the notch receptor, a transcription factor that can instantly initiate signal transduction to um, initiate transcription, excuse me, that is going to lead to changes in gene expression without having to have amplification of signal. So those two transcription systems, the JAK-STAT in cytokine receptors 
and the notch ligand in immune cells are going to be examples of what we consider to be the fast tracking. And those fast trackings are going to be found in many different cell types. What I'm going to do now is to look at a different point of signal transduction, which is how signals from multiple receptors can converge inside the cell through crosstalk and therefore activate similar pathways that will lead to a cellular response. In this image, what we have are four different receptors that bind four different ligands, ligand A, B, C, and D. We have two different kinase proteins inside the cell that could be activated, shown here by the arrows, or inhibited, shown here by the flat arrows, uh, by these signaling pathways. So for example, receptor B is able to induce signals that, it's go that are going to activate kinase A, but also activate kinase 2. So kinase 1 and kinase 2 are activated, and therefore they can phosphorylate sites in a target protein that once phosphorylated, it can induce to a cellular response. So pr protein B is sufficient to activate both kinase 1 and kinase 2. On the other hand, receptor A is able to activate kinase 1 but not kinase 2. Kinase 2 is activated by signaling from receptor D. So in other cell lines, you will require both signal A and signal D to be able to activate kinase 1 and kinase 2 respectively to eventually phosphorylate the target protein and get the same kind of response. So now you can see that two different pathways converge at one effector molecule because each of them are able to activate a different signaling pathway and effector molecule um, separately. Receptor C is an interesting one because its effects are able now to inactivate kinase 1 or kinase 2. So the response that you get once multiple signaling pathways get activated will either result on the activation or the modulation of activation by having inhibitory responses. So that can lead to either very strong signals or signals that are going to be somewhat attenuated by the inhibitory effect of another in, um, receptor that are into, induced to modulate the effect of that particular target protein. So when we look now at multiple different receptors, here at activated G protein coupled receptor or on the right an activated receptor tyrosine kinase, we can see that we have about five different major pathways that could be activated the activation of adenylcyclase that results in protein kinase A activation, activation of the MAP kinase pathway, activation of the AKT kinase that we discussed today, or the combined activation of cyclic, um, excuse me, of the combined activation of calmodulin, which leads to calmodulin kinase activation through calcium, or the protein kinase C. But what you, you can appreciate from here, for example, is that the phospholipase C system can be activated either via a G protein that is activated by a, GPC, a GPCR or the activation of a phospholipase C that can be activated by a receptor tyrosine kinase. So one pathway system can be activated by multiple receptors and therefore you get the effect of crosstalk which is the integration of the signaling pathways at the activation level. So don't think that one pathway is exclusively activated by one molecule binding to its receptor because they can actually crosstalk to one another. For example, the signaling that you use in the most recent lab to activate um, migration of neutrophils involve the g coupled protein receptor CXCR2. That receptor was bound by IL-8. And when they bind by IL-8, this GPCR this G protein coupled receptor is able to do multiple things. It's able to recruit checks and by recruiting checks it's able then to activate stat um, transcription factors that are going to allow for gene expression 
but is able also to activate monomeric G proteins. And those monomeric G proteins are able eventually to activate the MAP kinase pathway that can also lead to transcription factors to activate gene expression. It could also activate PI3 kinase, and by activating PI3 kinase, it's going to eventually activate AKT, which is going to give survival signals to the cell. Also, it activates phospholipase C, which results in the release of diacylglycerol and IP3. Diacylglycerol and IP3 activate protein kinase C, and protein kinase C gets activated and therefore can phosphorylate targets that are going to mediate adhesion, chemotaxis, and polarization. So the same receptor, as you can see by crosstalk, it is communicating with multiple different pathways that result in gene expression, adhesion, chemotaxis, and polarization, or eventually by arranging the cytoskeleton, internalization of the receptors that can be recycled or degraded. So not one single pathway can be activated, but the activated pathway can happen by multiple sites. So don't tend to think that the signal transduction pathways activate only one single pathway, whereas they can activate multiple pathways to result in multiple different phenotypes. So how do we know this? We have known these pathways by studying signaling receptors through two different ways. Number one, we can study it by proteomics, where we can do site-directed mutagenesis that is going to allow us to inactivate a domain, and therefore by activating that, inactivating that domain, we can try to fine-tune and understand which domain of the protein activates which part of the signal transduction pathway. Or, as we have done before, we have an a pharmacological agent library that basically allows to determine uh, and block signal transduction pathways by inhibiting molecules. So in the same way that we have used malate or we have used certain toxins to inhibit pathways that we have learned earlier in the Krebs cycle or signaling from neurons, we have pharmacological agents that are going to allow us to disrupt specific signaling pathways and therefore see what are all the pathways that are activated. So let's take a quick look at how site-directed mutagenesis work. So what you basically do with site-directed mutagenesis is the intentional mutation of the genetic code. So you're able to mutate one or more amino acids specifically to substitute them for a different amino acid. In this case, for example, what we have is a plasmic vector that contains a gene shown here in pink. And in the gene, we have a codon that encodes for one particular amino acid that you want to change. Now, when you are about to uh, have this product, you can separate the two strands by heating them. And therefore, you can bring a probe that has a very large homology to the sequence that you want to uh, modify, except that you can now have one single base pair that is going to modify that codon. So this synthetic CNA primer contains a mutated sequence. So the sequence that we want to mutate now was the CTG sequence, and now we're going to put a complementary sequence, but instead of putting an A, we're going to put a C. So now the sequence have a G, C, C. That GCC now, uh, you're going to let the DNA polymerase to continue elongation and DNA replication in both sides, and the enzyme DNA ligase to seal the plasmid. And when you allow this plasmid to be um, incorporated into cell, the plasmid is going to generate two daughter plasmids. One plasmid is going to contain the wild type sequence containing the GTC, but the other one, because it's going to be also um, uh, replicated by DNA polymerase, now it's going to contain the um, mutated codon. So the wild type codon, for example, will encode a protein with an asparagine um, amino acid at that position, but the mutated molecule is going to now contain an alanine. So in that way, you can directly change the sequence of the protein by one amino acid, or more, depending on how much you're doing it. 
So this is what we did uh, with many of the tyrosines that are present in receptor tyrosine kinase. So for example, we kind of alluded to that during the um, lecture um, on Friday. And here what we have on the left is a wild type receptor where it is able to recruit adapter proteins that are going to bind to specific phosphotyrosines. So in the upper picture, what we have now, it's a receptor where we have mutated through um, the mutation uh, pathway that I just described, one tyrosine for an alanine. So now what we then do is have ligand and see which of the adapter molecules are recruited. So in that way, by mutating the tyrosine position 2, we are able to see that only adapter protein 1 and 3 are recruited, and therefore we can conclude that adapter protein 2 is binding to phosphotyrosine 2, so binding to the tyrosine in position number 2. If we now, as shown here in the bottom, mutate the tyrosine by site-directed mutagenesis to be an alanine in position 3, and we add ligand, we can therefore now see that we can recruit adapter protein 1 and 2, but not adapter protein 3. So this kind of mechanism has allowed us to determine the function of some of these adapter proteins because we can then um, control which adapter protein is recruited into the receptor once activation, when activated, excuse me, by adding a signal molecule and therefore elucidate their function. Another way that we have done this is to induce, introduce into cells proteins that are mutated. So these mutated proteins could be completely on 100% of the time, or could be mutated so they're completely off 100% of the time. So these constitutively active or inactive mutants are able to allow us to determine downstream effectors and also allow us to determine the order of the components that are present in activation. So in this case here, for example, we have a constitutively active RAS molecule that cannot hydrolyze GTP and therefore is going to stay on the on stage 100% of the time. So in this pathway, for example, we have a receptor tyrosine kinase that you add ligand that eventually is going to lead to the activation of this protein X, which is going to have normal signaling because it's wild type. Protein X eventually activate normal RAS protein and is going to allow the exchange of GDP for GTP. And now activated RAS is able to exert of effects in the active normal signaling protein Y. And protein Y eventually does some level of signaling. But what happens if we mutate protein X? In this case, if we only mutate protein X, whenever we add ligand, the receptor will be activated, it will try to activate protein X, but because protein X is now mutant, you do not get activation of RAS. RAS stays in the GDP state, which is inactive, and therefore it's not able to activate protein Y, and protein Y will not perform its signaling function. But if we mix a cell where we have a mutant protein X and a constitutively active RAS molecule, we can see that in the absence of ligand, that RAS molecule that is constitutively active is able to now activate normal Y and therefore induce signal. Because the RAS molecule is acting downstream of the mutant X, it is able to rescue the mutation uh, exerted by mutant X indicating that RAS comes after mutant X. This is the type of mutation that we call a complementation mutation because RAS is active and is working downstream of X. It is able then to induce signal. But what happens if RAS is upstream of a mutant protein? That is going to be the next example. So over here, the mutant protein is going to be Y. So under normal circumstances, you will have a cell that has mutant protein Y. So whenever you add ligand, the receptor tyrosine kinase is active, which will activate the normal protein X that will activate the normal RAS. But now because 
protein Y is mutated, normal RAS cannot activate it, and therefore will be no signal. So to determine if Y is upstream or downstream of RAS, you can now come with a constitutively active RAS and determine if that is going to activate the protein. But what you see is that since mutant Y is downstream of RAS, it, that constitutively active RAS fails to rescue the signaling pathway because it is not able to activate the mutant protein X, Y, excuse me, and therefore there's no signaling. So that will indicate that the mutation in the mutant protein Y, it's downstream of the activated RAS. And therefore you can now by the combination of these three mutants that you generated, mutant X, mutant RAS that is always on, and mutant Y, you can determine the linearity of the pathway saying that protein X is activated after the receptor gets engaged and that activates RAS and eventually that activates Y. The last part of this lecture is a list of inhibitors or activators that are going to help us study signal transduction. We have talked, for example, about G proteins having a G protein I, which is inactivated adenyl cyclase, or a G protein S, which is a stimulated adenyl cyclase. So by adding pertussis toxin, you, you can, for example, lock the alpha subunit in a GDP state and therefore block activation of adenyl cyclase. On the other hand, you have cholera toxin that is able to lock the alpha unit in a GTP state and also active. So those are the ones that we already learned by uh, during the G-protein couple receptor lectures. Now what I want to introduce you are two different inhibitor molecules. One of them is permanadate. Permanadate, permanadate is going to inhibit the phosphatase uh, removing tyrosine on the phosphate, and therefore you're going to have an increased amount of um, tyrosines that are going to maintain their phosphate, and that induces a prolonged signal. So that keeps the receptor on an on state. The other ones are going to be inhibitors of calmodulin kinases, and therefore those inhibited calmodulin kinases will block the effects of increased calcium concentration on the cell. So then you can determine what is the effect of blocking calcium and what are the uh, mechanisms that calcium can induce. So with this last slide, I'll stop the lecture. Um, make sure to watch the lecture. And remember, we're going to have a short quiz about the material this lecture on Monday. Have an awesome weekend.